welcome to another episode of Be Seen TV. I'm your host, Will Wilson, hosting on skate in the beautifully mild weather in downtown Calgary. We have an amazing rest of the season for Be Seen TV with new faces and some special guests lined up. This episode features one of Calgary's hottest events and a true story of survival. This is Be Seen TV. means a new star for many and BC TV is no exception. Last episode we showed you an authentic graffiti artist who made a mural and logo for us. Here is the big reveal. I'm Justin Zach and I'm a graffiti artist. Yeah I'm really excited to be part of this project and doing doing the logo for the show. Um, and I'm glad that I can tie that in and then do a professional mural on top of that so it's not just doing the logo, there's other aspects of it and I can use my art in different ways to help the show out. I love to support the local arts, which is why BC and TV attended one of the hottest events called Raw Artist Calgary, and Standard Night Club was jam-packed. Take a look. I'm both a painter and a curator, so I help organize the events and then I'm also in other events as well. So I kind of have the two sides. I have the side of the artist and then the side of the business, which I think helps me a lot. To me, raw is raw talent, raw passion, and raw dedication for the arts. And that's across nine different genres of art, and it's supporting local and emerging talent within each city that raw operates in. And do you think you see this event in Calgary going really far in the future? I do. So this is our first one. This is our launch showcase. And in 2015, we have five more showcases happening. So I'm hoping by the end of the year, this is going to be the biggest art event in Calgary. Not just art, but maybe the biggest event in Calgary. We're with Desiree. Desiree had painted this beautiful painting behind us. Tell us, what did it, what inspired you to paint all these gorgeous paintings here tonight? Um, each painting is inspired by a different life experience, so they're all very unique. Um, the one behind me was inspired 
inspired by daybreak after a storm. So it's a big metaphor for me, and I have a lot of light play between dark and light in my work. Um, and it's, yeah, it's all to sort of symbolize that it's always darkest before the dawn. And so I have a lot of color in my work, but I have a reference to dark as well. Are you really excited to be part of the Raw Calgary event tonight? Yeah, this is this is an amazing turnout for the first event. This is incredible. Absolutely. And what do you see for your future as an artist starting here from Calgary? Um, here from Calgary, I just got some commercial representation. So as soon as I have that under my belt, then I'm looking at broadening and getting international representation. And I really would like to have my work go global. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Desiree. Jasmine, he, she painted these amazing paintings behind us and the ones over there. Tell us how it's like to be part of the Raw Calgary event. This event is insane. Like, I never expected such a great turnout. I've been in a few shows before, but nothing like this. It's really awesome because they have all kinds of art, as you probably know, with the makeup artists and everything like that. It's just been really great, like, integrating into this community. And for somebody being such uh, so passionate about art, how does this event feel compared to a lot of other events in the city? I feel like this one's really accessible for people who don't know too much about art. Yeah. There have been other art shows I've been in that have been really conceptual and people have been a little bit confused by some of the art pieces, but I feel like all the art here is really accessible. And how did you come up with the inspiration to come up with these uh, paintings here? Well, it's kind of a dark subject, but my paintings deal with beauty and mental health issues. So all the women in the paintings that are shown are actually women that have taken their own lives because they have succumbed to the pressures of the modeling and fashion industry. And do you think these paintings make a, a deep impact on a lot of people who see it? I would like them to. I really want to bring awareness to the stigma of mental health and beauty. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much and we're looking forward to more of your paintings in the future. Brandon, do you feel really excited and proud that your paintings are here at Raw Calgary tonight? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's great exposure for all the artists and uh, first time for me actually being... Uh, what inspired you to paint these paintings? Uh, I'm inspired by overseas world events that might not necessarily be covered in our media. Where do you see your art going in the future? International, hopefully. International. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Brandon. Your paintings are amazing. Thank you very much. So Corey, how do you feel of your paintings being here at Raw Calgary tonight? I'm super excited. I mean, this is obviously a really busy event and uh, I think it's going to be great for uh, exposure within the uh, city of Calgary. When I see the world, I, I see a lot of things like uh, urban growth and the way that structuralism and like urban things are built and we build it around organic places and we conflict with nature and things of organic senses. So I, I have a, like a really big interest in kind of like the contrast between like an organic and urban setting. So that's like where my inspiration comes from. Fantastic. Thank you, Corey. Thank you very much. I'm in it because I'm passionate and I'm dedicated and I think to be in the arts you really really need to have that dedication and passion shining through more than anything else you need to do it because you love it we're open to everybody as long as they love what they do I'm gonna help them as much as I can in their career hi there bet you weren't expecting to see me here I'm Paul J Chinook I've done lots of work behind the scenes here at BC TV and this is my big debut co-hosting. I've been in the Alberta film and TV industry for a few years now, and I'm currently writing a screenplay showcasing the bold and adventurous spirit of Alberta. Our next story is also about a local filmmaker, Neil Webb. Neil's most recent psychological thriller has been five years in the making. It's titled Double Booked. 
take a look. So it's a story about uh, a group of friends on vacation who go out to a, a cabin that they've rented. And when they arrive there, they realize that the cabin's been rented by another couple. And uh, after that, they, they, you know, they decide that the place is big enough for all of them to stay. So they all decide to stay there. But, uh, you know, as tensions begin to mount, you find out that there's more links between the two. A darker past links the two groups together, and uh, their fate is not as simple as just being double booked. We can all just stay here. It's a big house. You guys good? Sure. Why not? Those were the initial reactions that I got out of think, coming up with that idea. You know, like when my brother and I were talking, be like, oh, that's going to be so good. I hope this works. And so, you know, I definitely have favorite scenes in the movie, but uh, that, that overall, the, the overall vibe of the kind of twistiness of the story is what I like best. The end of product that will be released tonight, lots yeah. of people will be coming here to, to see it for the first time. Are you really proud of what you'll be showing? Is this something that you feel like you've accomplished a big milestone in your life? Oh, absolutely. It's been, like I said, it's been like four or five years from beginning to end. It's a chunk of my life. My heart and soul's in it. Uh, there's been, you know, thousands of man hours between like 30, 40 people that have, that have helped get this together. So just to have people out. Basically, there's, there's as I can't remember who the famous filmmaker was who said it, but there's three cuts of a movie. The writer's version, that's one version. The director's version, the version you film, and then the editor's version. So there's basically, they're, they're all very different because I pictured in my head one way, and then we got the cast in, to, in into their roles, and I'm like, okay, so I see how this is gonna work, and we filmed it, I'm like, okay, now I know how it's gonna look even more. And then when we're editing it together and you have to worry about pacing and everything, it turns into a whole different beast. The, I mean, the commitment just comes from knowing that this is, this is what I'm kind of meant to do. And, you know, it, it, that kind of excitement and, and it was just something that was able to keep me motivated along the way. And that I know that I will never look back at this, even though it's taken me the better part of like four years from, from beginning to end to really complete it. But I, I, I know that I'll never look back and regret having done this. And actually four years down the road, I, you know, I look back and I'm so glad that I was able to do this and that I had so many great people kind of supporting and helping along the way, so. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see Double Booked. Kensington Theatre often supports local artists like Neil. So check out Double Booked and support a local theatre and a local filmmaker. Coming up next is an inspirational story of survival that reminds us it only takes a second for our lives to change forever. We are joined with a very special guest in the studio today. Not only did he survive a serious life-threatening collision, but he lives by example of a second chance. With a new perspective, his inspiring story is just a reminder how our lives can change in a blink of an eye. Thank you so much for joining us today. So tell us a little bit about what had happened, um, like how your life changed in 1986, is that correct? Yeah. The collision was yeah. done. And so, how was your perspective different before than it is now? Oh, in so many ways. The, the uh, motorcycle accident w had a profound effect on the way I was looking at life in general. Uh, prior to the accident, I was kind of coasting along doing the, you know, the typical American dream thing, marriage, uh, job, fast track career, you know, dedicated to goals, all of those sorts of things. And, and the motorcycle accident was a real wake up call. And uh, I remember for 16 hours I was in ER being transferred back and forth between two hospitals. They thought that my aorta, the inner lining of my aorta was ruptured, and at any moment I could die from that part of it. Plus, yeah, that's I, the yeah. main artery of the heart. Yeah, the, the big artery. Usually it's like two or three seconds after that explodes of, of life. And then, and so the doctors had told me that while I was in ER. And so for the better part of, you know, 10 hours or so, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, if you go now, Leo, 
what have you done? What have you accomplished? And, you know, I was looking at the things like, you know, had a nice car, had nice clothes, had a, you know, a, a, a marriage that, you know, in, in typical terms was pretty successful and uh, had a company that I had been building for a couple years, very successful, had just sold that actually to an interior design company with an agreement to work with them for a year. And the motorcycle accident happened about a week and a half after I started working for them. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty interesting. But while I was in the, in the, in the ER, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all of the things that I've done, all of the things that I haven't done, and I realized the biggest thing that I hadn't done was I hadn't chased my dreams and and I'm quite the dreamer uh, I grew I grew up in a in a house uh, in in some people would say a very unstable home because mom suffered from some manic depressive which meant that there was incredible highs and excitements and celebrations and then on the other side were really lows and uh, so I kind of got into a state of mind of, of kind of servicing her in the family which then transferred to servicing my wife <laughs> when, when I got married and but you know the accident I'm sitting there I'm thinking well you know you're doing all of this and putting all this love and energy and effort into other people and you really are not following your dreams and so so how do you would you define what your perspectives from before the collision and and now like what has been some of the drastic actions you changed in your life and, and thought processes? The, the most important thing was not to try to learn how to eliminate procrastination and not sit on anything that excited me or inspired me. I recently read a, a quote that uh, said, what did it say? Oh, you know, one of my, by the way, one of my favorite authors is Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote a, a, a book called The Four Agreements. And his son has become a writer as well and recently released a book. And a quote from his book says, as we grow older, we should stop trying to learn anything that takes away from inspiring us. So whatever we've learned, that it doesn't inspire us or isn't useful to push us on to experience, to love, to grow, to, to move, to adventure, for lack of better words, should be eliminated. And, and I would say in many ways that connected with me because after the accident, I really started to eliminate all the things that were not inspirational all the things that were, were keeping me down, holding me back, trying to mold me into, again, the American you know, standard, for lack of better words. Um, since then, um, I really made a lot of changes. It took a little while to ramp up because I was really suffering a lot of physical ailments. I had vertigo for, I think between two and three months after the accident, like a really heavy spins. So I had difficulty driving or doing any of that. Uh, I also suffered uh, several broken ribs, shoulder, knee, many things that kind of kept me stationary. Uh, but all of this really kind of held me to introspection to get me thinking about you know what I'm doing where I'm going why I'm doing these things and uh, previous to that I had been a big reader of philosophy and particularly particularly drawn to inspirational type of readings uh, so um, I'm losing my place a little bit. That happens on occasion as, as kind of a part of that brain damage. My, uh, the, the brain damage affected my short-term memory, and so there are occasions where I get distracted and I lose place. And, you know, a, a, a bank of doctors said this is kind of normal for anybody who receives, you know, uh, head trauma as a child, but I hadn't up till then so this was something that I had to really get into and learn about you know how does the brain process memories how does the brain works how does the body heal how does the body work um, shortly after the accident I was suffering you know a lot of pain as you can imagine and the doctor's solution were uh, you know drugs 
drugs for the pain, drugs for the mood. And I don't really do well with synthetic drugs, so I started looking at alternatives. And a friend uh, uh, bet me that if I went to the YMCA a couple days a week, got on a stationary bicycle for 20 minutes each time, that it would help me improve my pain management. Well, that kind of naturally turned into uh, several months and several years. I became a fitness instructor as a result of, of it, you know, researching how the body works, how the body heals, kinesiology, all the rest of that stuff. <clears throat> and within five years or so, I was teaching aerobic classes and I w because of the nature of what I experienced, I was able to help others who had had injuries or you know, were, were really, uh, let's say, overweight or out of fit and were trying to rebuild their life and get back into something. Were you ever um, bitter or angry that um, this accident happened to you? Did you ever feel oh, like sure. a, a victim? Can you explain those oh, kinds of emotions sure. that, oh, that came mean, about? You know, um, um, there are several stages that one experiences when going through that sort of physical trauma. You know, uh, there, there were times where there were weeks on end where I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to get out of bed, you know. Uh, even even the TV wasn't interesting after a while. It was it was really a um, a dark time, a dark place, and and that, by the way, didn't go away quickly. That took a lot of years, actually, with the the memory issues. Uh, you know, I grew up, I grew up the son of a father who was who was very strict and very hard. I mean, uh, he had full love in his heart to help me grow and become the best that I could be. And he saw some magic in me that I certainly didn't see at the time. But, um, you know, I think it took me the better part of 15 years or more to actually retrain my memory and retrain my mind. And th that length of time combined with my, my own worst critic, for lack of better words, Words, you know, I hit some really hard times here and there along the way. Uh, I don't want to understate it, but I don't want to make too much of it because I found one of my greatest allies is not dwelling on the dark side, not dwelling on the pain, not dwelling on, you know, the things that, that keep me uninspired or prevent me from the adventure. And so how can you say now, maybe it's a blessing uh, in disguise almost, uh, how can you say now that your life has positively changed because of what you learned from something traumatic like that? Oh. <clears throat> you know, uh, one of my jobs that I'm doing right now, I have three jobs, by the way. One, I do the photography thing. That is a dream of mine and a passion. But I'm also working at a wild bird store, and I work at the warehouse slogging bags of seed that are 20, 40, and 50-pound bags. <laughs> it's really hard physical work. Uh, but that in and of itself, rather than going to the gym and getting on treadmill and doing weights, I found being active with other people and doing a, a physical job like this helps to keep me from falling back into, into pain because I still do suffer pain today, you know, what is it, 30 years after the accident. And if, if I don't stay physically active and physically adventurous, I, I do slide back into that dark place. Uh, the other job that I have too is at Tailblazers in Acadia. It's a, a health food store for dogs, right? And I love dogs because one of the one of the blessings that dogs has brought me is that activity. Right, and, and that activity is always playful with dogs. Um, but uh, the reason I brought that up was, uh, I was I was at work yesterday, and one of the women who works for, uh, um, uh, can't recall the positive match it's a it's an animal a, a dog rescue foundation she was in and we were talking about her husband who had dropped off a little puppy who got adopted we were so happy and full of tears because his dog was so amazing but the the uh, Leslie one of the owners of the store she was asking me who was that guy that brought the dog in and of course I didn't know because I'm kind of new to the store she didn't recognize him because he had lost so much weight and looked so 
different. Now, Betty, his wife, was in the store yesterday and we were talking and she said he had got cancer. And when he got cancer, it transformed his life. He lost all this weight and, and went through big changes. I would never have known that by looking at him because, you know, he just looked like a big, energetic, not like a thin, tall, energetic guy uh, with weeping tears as he was giving up his dog that he had been fostering for several weeks. Um, but she said something that really resonated with me. She said, you know, him getting cancer saved his life. And, and I really connected with that because the accident really did save my life as well. Shortly after the accident, well, some years, because I tried everything that I could to make the marriage that I was in work, which before the accident, I really didn't see how dreadful it was. I was so committed, you know, a, a old school father said, you know, one of the most important things in life when you get married is your wife and then your children, old school Italian, right? So, and, and anyway, um, yeah, the, the accident had that kind of a change in my life because it got me out of the things that were preventing me from helping others. Uh, and so if, if, you know, if I fast track or fast forward the whole scene that is Leo's life, I was in Indonesia a couple years ago working on a, a four year IT project with a mining company and I had an opportunity to work on weekends at an orphanage. And it, the, the, the joy that I brought to the children at the orphanage, first of all, by being there, we didn't speak the same language, so they didn't understand a word coming out of my mouth, nor did I understand a word coming out of their mouth, but we had an awesome time. I was really able to help make you know, their day a little bit brighter. And some of the stories were really, really tragic, but walking in with bags of fresh food and, and fresh meat and hearing all the kids screaming from all over the place, you know, Uncle Leo's here, Uncle Leo's here, Father's here, Father's here, was so amazing. And I could never have done that if it weren't for the motorcycle accident. Uh, prior to the accident, I had uh, had some discussions with my wife about an opportunity in China to go to work and share and you know and grow in China and the nature of the relationship was never going to allow me to to go that far do that much it, but the motorcycle did that for me it gave me a chance to then travel the world experience people grow learn languages Fantastic. Well, you have a very fascinating and inspiring story, but we can also look at your photography, photography work. Uh, if you'd like to see some of Leo's photography, go to modelmayhem.com. Well, that was an incredible story. Absolutely. If you have an inspiring story you'd like to share with us, feel free to email us at bcntv at shaw.ca or find us on Twitter at bcntv. You can also follow me, Paul J. Chinook, on Twitter at drillbitchinook. I'm Will Wilson. And I'm Paul J. Chinook. See you next time.